All right, it's church time. Stand together. Ron will lead us in a number. Page 410, near the cross. Good day. Was this a pretty day? Did you get any work done? <laughs> Larry played golf all day. <laughs> Are you happy? Amen. All right, singing on page 410. Jesus King. first verse over and we'll just gather around this is prayer meeting night oh Jesus keep me Yeah. 
This is our Wednesday night prayer meeting, so if you have a prayer request, or a praise report, give that in at this time, and we'll gather around the altar for prayer. Yes, Jean? Any others? Yes. All right. All right. Remember Jeff in your prayers. Remember Janet Blanchard. Yes. Remember Ed Barney. Yes. Remember Patty both of those. Their last chemo yesterday and another round of things today. So remember her. She, she went to sleep on the night of the All right. Let's remember all those requests. Any others? All right. Oh. All right. Any others? Any unspoken requests? You'll raise your hand, all that we'll gather around the altar as we sing. Sing with us. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. That calls me from a world of care. tonight as we go to the Lord in prayer.
time for tonight's offering. Brother Nelson, would you pray for the offering? Ask Henry to get ready to sing for us tonight. What a good day, huh? Got a little warm, but it was still a good day. I'm glad to be here. I've been thinking about the miracles, the greatest of all miracles oh, today. Yeah. I don't know why the, it's, the miracles come to my mind today. I thought about it several times, and uh, I'm just thankful for the miracle of the new birth, the miracle that the Lord performed on me the day that I accepted him as my Savior. So you pray for me. I wasn't there by the shores of Galilee when Jesus touched those blinded eyes and made them see and though I did not see the empty tomb that day I still believe yes I know what Jesus did for me I believe of his hand but the greatest of all miracles was when Jesus saved me yes I know Life anew be made pure, pure and whole. And I have felt him loose the chains of sin and set my spirit free. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. I believe. of his hand but the greatest of all miracles was when Jesus saved me yes 
for me and out beside the highway in 1973 he made a new creature out of me he picked up an old rotten sinner and come into my life and made a new man out of me and I can't do anything but praise him for that praise. he can do it for me he can do it for anyone amen Jesus passed by I'm thankful the day that he passed by out on the interstate, I'm, I, I was just a miserable soul because uh, someone had been telling me all that I need. I wasn't a churchgoer. I mean, I went two or three times a year, and uh, and I couldn't wait to get out the door then. But once the Lord touched my heart, I couldn't wait to get in the door. Every time it's been open since I've been here, and I praise Him for that tonight. <laughs> As the blind man was sitting there by the way, he cried to Jesus for mercy that day. Jesus commanded and gave him his sight. So he followed Jesus, and I'm sure he cried. Jesus passed by my way, and he made me whole that day. Just a sinner was I, but then Jesus passed by, and oh, what a change in my life, since Jesus passed by. Just like the blind man, I wandered alone in darkness of sin. I was always alone, but one day I met him, and he made things right. And oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Jesus passed by my way, and he made me whole that day. Just a sinner was I, but then Jesus passed by, and oh, what a change in my life, Jesus passed by. There's a change in a person's life when they when they meet the Lord. I, I have to tell you this because when he passed by, he took away that old man and put a new a new heart in me. And I didn't go home that night a cussing and a fuming. I didn't even kick the dog or anything like that. I went home a different man than what left that morning. And and uh, you you just have to have known me before because I was rotten to the core. I could out cuss a sailor, but. When I went home that night, I was a different person. I went straight in the house. Faye was at work at that time. The kids were still at school. And I took out every drop of booze I had in that house. 
and I sat on the counter, and each one I poured down the sink. Yes. I said, Lord, if you'll help me, I'll never touch another drop, and I'll never cuss again, and sure as you're sitting there. I had a habit of cussing that you wouldn't believe, and it went away just like that. From the time, from the time I fell on my face out there beside the road and asked him to help me, he took away the, the cussing, and I've never touched another drop. And God can, the Lord can work miracles, and he worked a miracle in me, and I can't do a thing tonight but praise him for it. Amen. Genesis chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Go ahead and pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for each and every one who made their way out to your house this evening. God, I pray for those who uh, have asked for uh, requests, uh, different ones who have needs tonight. God, you know each and every request. I pray that you would be with them to watch over them. We pray and comfort them at this time. God, I pray for those who have just had surgeries this week. I pray that they would uh, continue to heal and recover. Just to watch over uh, them, we pray. Be with us tonight for a few moments and help us to share what you've laid in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. According to a host of websites, the oldest person who ever lived was a woman by the name of Jean Louise Calment. Uh, she was born on February 21st, 1875 in Arles, France. She died on August 4th, 1997 at the age of 122 years old. Uh, one website uh, had this footnote at the bottom. It said, There are, however, also figures mentioned in various religions, ranging from Islam to Christianity to the Hindu faith, that claim to have historical figures, part of their stories, that live to be much older than Jean Louise Calment. Unfortunately, there are no official documents that can confirm their birth and death on a legal basis. So, of course, I assume that to some, the Bible's not considered an official document. Uh, therefore, what it says is not considered legal. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, and I'd say as far as you're concerned, we would agree the Bible is the most accurate and the more, most historical, reliable book that's ever been written before. Uh, and it's the Bible who tells us who the oldest person who ever lived was. His name is a man named Methuselah. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 verse 27, And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. Think of that. This guy was 31 years away from being 1,000 years old. I was bringing the girls home from school one day, and my 11-year-old said, Dad, you'll never believe what I learned today in class. I learned that Solomon had 969 wives. I said, well, no, he, he actually had a 1,000. What's 31 women, right? Give or take a few. But no, she was thinking of 969 years of age that Methuselah was. And as you think of this age, without a doubt, or, or these years, without a doubt, Jean Louise Calment lived an exceptionally long life. But Methuselah lived 847 years longer than Jean Louise Calment. In fact, when you read the early chapters of Genesis, you will find name after name of those who lived much longer than Jean Louise Calment. But Methuselah lived longer than them all. He earns the distinct title of being the oldest man who ever lived. And as we will see in our study tonight, there was a reason why he lived longer than any other person who has lived upon this earth. What we're going to see is that the length of his life was due to more than any diet that he was on or any exercise he was doing. It was due to the fact that this was God's plan and God's purpose. So tonight, I, I want us to get better acquainted with this man by the name of Methuselah, and I want to give you three facts about his life, and then we'll be finished. First of all, I want you to notice the message that he received. The message that he received. You see, Methuselah had a pretty well-known father as well. The scripture says his father was named Enoch. 
And in chapter 5, verse 21, it says, And Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. We also know Enoch is also known in verse 22 as a man who walked with God. So here we have a, a father who walked with with God, And I would say to you, nothing greater could be said of any father or any mother, for that matter, is that they are walking with God. But as we look closer at the birth of Methuselah, we see that it was his birth that influenced Enoch's walk with God. Notice verse 22. It says that Enoch walked with God, notice the next word, after he begat Methuselah. So, so please notice carefully, it was after Methuselah was born that Enoch began to walk with God. So it would appear that the birth of his firstborn son greatly impacted his life. Ebor Powell writes and says, The sacred record is content to say that Enoch merely lived for the first 65 years of his sojourn on earth. He was like any other man. He fulfilled his normal existence. Then suddenly everything changed. The expected baby arrived and from that moment the father was amazingly transformed. This glad event transported him to heights of joys unknown and the proud father was left with a consuming desire to keep in step with God hereafter. How many of you know many a parent with the birth of a child realized the importance of getting right with God? Getting in church, being faithful to the Lord. And no doubt when Enoch held his newborn son in his arms, he realized how important it would be to live for God. And as he looked into the eyes of his infant son, he, he may have thought how his son would one day walk in his footsteps. How many of you know that your kids are watching what you do? Your grandkids are watching what you do. I, I love the the poem, it's by an unknown author, but it says this. It says, walk a little slower, Daddy, said a little child so small. I'm following in your footsteps, and I don't want to fall. Sometimes your steps are very fast. Sometimes they're hard to see. So walk a little slower, Daddy, you are leading me. Someday when I am all grown up, you're what I want to be. Then I will have a little child who want to follow me. And I would want to lead just right and know that it was true. So walk a little slower, Daddy, for I must follow you see our children are watching and our grandchildren they're watching and the the responsibility of parenthood no doubt impacted Enoch's life but I want you to notice there was something more in the birth of Methuselah that got his attention and it was this I want you to look closely at the meaning of Methuselah's name the meaning of his name is most interesting. The name Methuselah actually means this. It means when he dies, it shall come. Now Matthew Poole in his commentary writes this, that his name means when he dies, the arrow of God's vengeance will come. So it would appear that in the naming of Methuselah, Enoch, as well as his generation, received a prophecy from God that judgment was coming. We see in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, and we read how God felt about the spiritual decline and the moral decline of man at that time. It said, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And repented the Lord that he had made man on earth. And it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now they didn't know then, but we know now that God would ultimately destroy the world by the means of a flood. And the birth of Methuselah was the first indication that God was going to destroy this world. That when Methuselah died, God's judgment would surely come. And I thought this no doubt gave Enoch the greatest cause to walk with God. Realizing that judgment was coming soon. 
realizing that when his son passed away, judgment was on its way. I, I, I thought, I wonder if Me, when Methuselah ever became sick, if Enoch ever thought to himself, I wonder if this is the hour. Or maybe if he felt the, the fever on his forehead, if, if it crossed his mind, is the time for God's judgment getting ready to fall. See, because Enoch knew that the death of his son would usher in that judgment. And I thought, if there is a reason why you and I should walk with God, more than anything else, it's the understanding one day you are going to stand before God. Saved or lost, there is a judgment day coming. How many know many live their life as if this life is all that matters? This is all there is, so this is how I'm going to live life. But friend, the life that is given to us is to prepare us for the life that is to come. And like Enoch, the thought of God's judgment should cause every lost person to turn to God and walk with him. Some of the most heart-wrenching words in the Bible, found in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, it says this, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, every single person, stand before God. And the sea, those who died in the sea, they gave up the dead. Death and hell delivered up the dead, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Understand tonight, there is a lake of fire awaiting those who die lost without God. But then there are those who are saved, and we will have a judgment too. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So for the unsaved, there's the great white throne judgment. For the saved, there's the judgment seat of Christ. For the unsaved, there's a judgment of hell. For the saved, there's a judgment of rewards. But in either case, understand, there will be, for you and for me, a face-to-face meeting with God. And I ask you, do we need anything more in our life to inspire a closer walk with God? So Enoch walked with God after he received the message in the birth of Methuselah that God's judgment was on its way. And that was the message that he received. But then secondly, we see there was not only the message that he received, but the mercy that was revealed. I want you to notice, as we continue reading, we see that the length of Methuselah's life is divided between the births of his own children. Genesis chapter 5, verse 25, it says that Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lamech. Then in verse 26 it says, And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 782 years and begat sons and daughters. Listen, how many of you would like to live that long between the birth of your children? 782 years. Think the nursery might need a little work? Maybe a new coat of paint? Crib needs a little adjusting? I came across a a website that's called Living to 100. The Life Expectancy Calculator. And the whole thing about the website is this. How close are you going to get to living to 100? Well, the website advertises that it it uses the most current and carefully researched medical and scientific data in order to estimate how old you're going to live. And there's a, a series of 30 to 40 questions they'll ask, and they're related to your health and your exercise and your family history. And just so you know, my life expectancy turned out to be 89 years. Well, we'll see. I thought, Ruby, if I just give up those five packs of cigarettes every day, I might live a little longer. (laughs) For those who are watching live, that was a joke. But in Methuselah's case, we don't need a living to 100 life expectancy calculator. He would need a living to 1,000 expectancy calculator. When it comes to calculating why he lived as long as he did, 
We don't have to look at his medical history. We don't have to look at his family history. The longevity of his life was determined by God and God alone. And I want you to know that the truth is the length of our lives, understand this, the length of our lives is determined by God. And I said this a couple weeks ago, you are immortal until God is finished with you in this life. Job 14.5 says, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. So understand, there is a boundary to the length of our life, and that boundary is determined by God. As for Methuselah, the boundary of his life had special meaning. As we've already seen, his name indicated that when he died, God's judgment would come. Now, when you understand that, that when he died, God's judgment was on its way, it makes the length of his life even more interesting. Because not only is Methuselah's name significant, but the length of his life is significant as well. And here's why. Have you ever thought, what was the reason for his long life? Why did God allow him to live so long? If the hour of his death ushered in God's judgment, then the fact that he lived longer than any other man who ever lived, giving men and women an extended opportunity to be saved, shows you the grace and mercy of our God right here in the Old Testament. You think about it. The longer he lived, the longer man had the opportunity to get right with God. In fact, there was only one man in his family who would be delivered from God's judgment. His name was Noah. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I would caution you, read about Noah, the one in the Bible, not the one in the movie theater. Okay? The one in the movie is not the Noah that you and I know about. That movie was produced by an atheist who said, there is no God. There is no God in the story of Noah. Let me tell you, God is all over the story of Noah. And he said it's the most unbiblical, biblical movie ever produced, and he's happy to stand by it. Well, let me tell you, if you're a Christian, I wouldn't support it one dime. God commanded Noah, you build an ark. And he said to him, thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. We know that because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, he and his immediate family were delivered from God's judgment. You read on in the New Testament, in 2 Peter 2, verse 5, it tells us that Noah was also a preacher of righteousness. That Noah was not only a a builder, he was also a, a preacher. And I thought, no doubt, as he built that ark, he was preaching righteousness to all those people. And he was calling for men and women to repent and turn to God. So understand, the length of Methuselah's life indicates that God was giving man an extended opportunity to get right with him. And I thought, even though God was grieved with the sinfulness of man... And God purposed to judge the world for its sin. The very man whose death would usher in that judgment lived longer than any human being that ever lived. What that says to you and I tonight, right here in the Old Testament, first book, it was God's way of declaring that even though he was a God of judgment, he was also a God of mercy. And aren't you glad for that tonight? So we see there was a message that was received in The mercy that was revealed. And last of all, tonight, I want you to notice the moment judgment was realized. God said in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Think of that for a second. That it had gotten so bad that God says to this world, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he that is also flesh, his days shall be a hundred and twenty years years now understand God is merciful God is a God of mercy but how many of you know there comes a time when God's mercy ends and God will act in judgment God commanded Noah to build an ark and it would take him 120 years to complete it but once that ark was completed 
Once that last wooden peg was driven, judgment was coming. And although God had, through the extended life of Methuselah, given man plenty of time to repent, the hour would come when mercy would be extended no more. We read in Genesis 7 verse 12, And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. The hour of judgment had come. And what I want you to see that is that that hour not only marked the completion of the ark, but it also marked the conclusion of Methuselah's life. Do you remember what his name means? When he dies, it shall come. Judgment shall come. And I truly believe that just before the first drop of rain fell, Methuselah breathed his last breath. Methuselah closed his eyes in death. Again, we read in verse 27 of chapter 5, And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Someone has said that Genesis chapter 5 is like reading the tombstones in a graveyard. As you read through the chapter name after name, with the exception of Enoch, it says he lived, this is how long he lived, and he died. So the significance of the death of Methuselah was that his death, as his name implied, would usher in God's judgment. Now we know there were a few like Enoch. There was Noah. They would take God's warning of judgment seriously. But as revealed in Noah and his family being the only ones spared from judgment, the rest of the world ignored the warning. The rest of the world spurned the opportunity to get right with God. So so as we come to a close, I want you to remember the name of Methuselah was a prophecy that judgment was coming, but men did not believe it. And I say to you, in our day, in our time, preachers who warn men Of the judgment to come, you know what they're viewed as? Old-fashioned, outdated. Oh, we've been hearing that forever. And I'm telling you, in a time when we have removed the words hell, judgment, wrath from our preaching, because we don't want to be offensive, something's wrong. So I want to tell you something. It does not change the fact one bit that judgment is still going to come to this world. I'm telling you, if every preacher in the world became silent on hell and on judgment, it wouldn't change the fact that one day the God of mercy, who desires all men to be saved, will become the judge of this earth. When Methuselah was born, and given his prophetic name, it was like God was drawing a line in the sand. Here's what's going to happen. Here's when it's going to happen. Judgment is certain. You remember what old John the Baptist standing on the banks of Jordan River boldly appealed to the men in Luke 3? He said, you flee from the wrath that is surely to come. So we say tonight, there is a wrath to come. There is a judgment that's coming. It is settled. It is certain. I was reading this week when the Apostle Paul was being transported as a prisoner to Rome. His ship docked to the south of Rome in an Italian port city. It's called Patoli. And this was a, a holiday resort for fashionable Roman society. There was a spa with nearby hot sulfur springs. Many of the Roman emperors had places of residence there. Patoli laid in the shadow of a great and rugged mountain, a volcano, though it hadn't erupted in a thousand years, named Vesuvius. Shortly after Paul's time, Vesuvius exploded like an atomic bomb. It erupted for 40 hours. And while Patoli was was spared, another nearby city was flooded with molten lava. 
They said even today you can see it where men and women and children were buried before they could escape. They didn't even know when it was coming. Didn't even know where it came from. They were killed by the the gases and the ash and the fire and the lava and then preserved by this molten lava which rolled over top of them and sealed them in this gigantic tomb. They look like statues. You can see the horror on some of their faces. They said that city was called Pompeii. For many years, it remained buried under 20 feet of hardened lava. Excavations have given us a a perfectly preserved Roman city, frozen in time. As one archaeologist said, they were caught in the act of being themselves. He said, when you look at it, you will see around 20,000 people who lived in Pompeii. They worshipped two gods. Venus, the love goddess, and Mercury, the god of commerce. So simply put, they they worshipped money and pleasure. Does that sound familiar today? Their worship of Mercury is evidenced by their economic prosperity. Pompeii was a thriving city. It was a a city uh, full of shop-lined streets. Many of its people worked in... The winery, Pompeii, was world famous for its wine. They were very, very wealthy, but they also loved pleasure. Excavators in Pompeii say the city walls were filled with advertisements of prostitutes. Prices indicating how much the average girl costs around the the, the price of a modest dinner at a, a Pompeii tavern. Excavators set on the walls of these brothels were testimonies of customers who had already been there. They said everywhere were models and carvings of very indecent, immoral symbols. They said in ancient Pompeii, these symbols were considered symbols of success. They carved them on their sidewalks and their houses was drawn on their walls. They even said the statues and sculptures of Pompeii that were excavated by archaeologists were hidden, were put in off-limits rooms of Italian museums because they were so obscene. But one excavator said this, on one wall of Pompeii, someone with a knowledge of the Old Testament had written some graffiti. Just three words, Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know, like Sodom and Gomorrah, Pompeii perished suddenly by fire. Judgment came swiftly. Judgment came without warning. And there was no escape. They were literally caught in the act of being themselves. And Pompeii, like Sodom and Gomorrah, like our world today, our nation today, is full of corruption, it's full of confusion, it's full of filth. And you know what we're doing? We're just awaiting the judgment of God. We don't know when the volcano of judgment is going to erupt, but buddy, it's coming. And I wonder what America would look like if it too were caught in the act of being itself. Bernard Malix wrote this, just a small little poem. He said, the world is very evil. The times are waxing late. Be sober and keep vigil. The judge is at the gate. He wrote that in the 11th century. I wonder what he'd say today. I want you to know tonight as we close, God has warned us of his coming judgment through his word. God warned them in the Old Testament through a baby, Methuselah. Thousands of years ago, judgment was coming. But understand, whether God warns through a baby or through a Bible, the judgment of God is certain. And we had better be ready. Amen. Let's stand together. Heads bowed and eyes closed as we get a song of invitation.
Maybe you're here tonight and you have loved ones who are out of the will of God. Maybe they're living this life like those who lived it in the time of Pompeii. You have loved ones who are not saved. You have loved ones who maybe have come to church, but they don't have a true salvation experience with our Lord and Savior. You're here tonight. You have loved ones, friends, whatever it may be. They need the Lord. Judgment is coming. You want to remember them in prayer. Would you just slip up your hand by saying pray for all my loved ones. Bless all the hands here tonight. Bless all the hands here tonight. Judgment's coming. I'm telling you, in an hour that we do not know of, God is going to split through the skies and come back for us. We had better be ready. And if we know judgment is coming, if we know God is coming back at any moment, shouldn't that give us the initiative to live our lives in such a way that God could come at any moment? And shouldn't we be living our lives in such a way that we will be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with our loved ones who are unsaved, who don't know Christ? His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't have a relationship with the Lord. You've never been saved. I want you to know you will stand before God one of these days face to face and you will give an account of your life. You say, well, I've made too many mistakes. Uh, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The great thing is Jesus came to earth, died, and took your sins. All you have to do is put your faith and your trust in that Savior. You're here tonight. You're unsaved. Would you be honest? Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Would you just slip up your hand by that saying, pray for me. Bless that hand. Any other? Bless that hand. Anyone else? I'm not a Christian. Bless that hand. I see it. You can put it down. Any others? I'm not a Christian. I ask you tonight, those who raised your hand, you're not saved. Time is of the essence. You are not going to live forever. You are one heartbeat away from eternal separation. My prayer is tonight you would get things right with the Lord. You're here tonight. You have loved ones who are unsaved. My prayer is you would step out and come and you would lift them up in prayer tonight. Give them over to God. If you're unsaved, I pray you'll step out tonight, come to an altar, and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior. There'll be others to come with you. You say, I don't know what to say. There'll be others that will lead you to this Savior that we know that gives eternal life. Save you from this time of judgment. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. And though, Lord, it's not always uh, just uh, honey and cream and sweet things, God, there is wrath. There is judgment. There is a time that you and I and everyone in here will stand before your face and give an account. Amen. God, I pray for those who are unsaved tonight. They're lost and they need you. And if they don't get things right and they perish, they will spend an eternity separated. I pray they will make a decision tonight for you. For those who have loved ones, God, I pray they would step out and come and, and lift these up to the Lord in prayer. We love you. We thank you, God. Help us to respond to what your Holy Spirit is saying. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, would you come? Page 81. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou be. Others, raise their hands. They need to come. Maybe you're unsaved here. Just step out. Come down. Kneel down. There'll be someone to come and pray with you. Would you come? Just as I am waiting to read my soul of one heart blood to thee whose blood can cleanse me sorrow land of God I come I come continue to sing if you need to pray just as I am the will receive Will dwell on pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. 
just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou be you if you have a, a loved one who's who's lost write them a letter this week send them an email a text just tell them you're, you're praying for them that God laid uh, them on your heart and you're just you're just praying for them uh, I, I do believe and you you look at the world scene and, and it's it's getting bad yes. and it's probably only going to get worse I hate to tell you but what did Jesus say look up when these things happen for your redemption draweth nigh so write, write your loved ones and then just give them a call and just tell them you're praying for them. And, and I, I pray the Holy Spirit's already setting up uh, this, this uh, communication, this invitation that you're going to be speaking with them. And, and maybe the words you say might, might do something. So let's just remember, and I pray that you would do that this week. Any announcements before we're dismissed? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yes, yes, God amen. Isn't it good that people get saved still yeah, on Wednesday thank night Lord. services? Thank, thank the Lord, Lord for that. Amen, yes. amen. Uh, Any other? Yes. All right, this Sunday Bible company.